Okay, so here we go. This is called Chapter 6, The God of the Philosophers. And I wanted to... Um, I'm going to do something because it's going to mean something later in the in, in a kind of the, in preparation for our service for our service for our class there is a part in this in this class where our author talks about the, the sound of a word and what it means spiritually some religions have some very specific like the in the hindu religion the the, the word aum means something very specifically but i wanted to share with you I can do it with my mask on. <laughs> you can hear me. Margaret Athey taught a women's group a song, and some of you might remember it. We sang this chant that we walked down the Mission Road aisles and sang. And the first time she taught us the song, we all laughed at her. And we said, no way are we going to do this in church. But then we practiced it. And she, you know, if you know Margaret, she's like, we're going to do this. <laughs> yeah. So we practiced it and it became one of the most profound experiences of my life because we had a bell. We rang the bell thing. You know, just I didn't ring my bell, but ring. Ring, yeah, and, yeah. and then here's what we sang. Let me just do a little bit of it. Okay. God so loved the world that he gave his only song. And whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That's all I remember. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it just repeats. I know. I, I can't remember how it ends in, it ends in, in actually six parts. Did anybody, re anybody remember us doing that? Yeah. Because it was, we walked down the aisles. We made, we did much slower than that. Uh -huh. And I believe that is what our author is talking about with, it was the first time that those words resonated in me as I sang. So it was <laughs> listening to the words and listening between the words, okay? So remember that as we continue. And I'm sorry, it's morning. I don't sing so loud, but I did all right. I did. Sounds beautiful. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Okay, Jonathan. How do I do next? Now, am I supposed to be doing now, that? Now PCRO. Jonathan, oh, am, I, am I supposed to be doing that now or just for church? Just for church. Okay. He and I are doing it now. Okay. 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 So this is chapter six, and we're talking about philosophy, and it went a little bit different than I thought it was going to go, because uh, there's actually, ironically, in the early, it's we're talking about like the early eighth or ninth centuries. So it was the Muslims that turned to philosophy a little bit quicker than other religions. But I wanted to put this. This up here, this was a, this was a little refresher course because we've already talked about Plato a little bit, Aristotle a little bit, and this guy Plotinus, who was the Neoplatist. We've talked about him in past chapters, but I wanted to remind you of some of the important things that they said that, that these other guys are kind of re-churning in their religions, okay? Because remember, the philosophers are all Greek times before Christ, it's 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 a it was kind of a battle with Judaism, but it wasn't a battle with any other mono, monotheists at the time. So Plato, remember, had that forms thing where he had um, he had the people, and then he had the shadow of the people. And what he says is that a good society must be led by a philosopher, ruling according to rational principles, which he could convey to ordinary people. And then Aristotle was his student. Aristotle, this, this, is, this is obviously just a little glimpse at them again. Matter is eternal. History is inferior to philosophy because philosophy has no beginning, middle, or end. Then he talked about the cosmos emanating eternally from God. 
this is where he said God is the prime mover, the uncaused cause of those, those terms that we get. He is the origin, the source of the motion, pure immat immaterial form, who engages in the sole occupation of thinking. I like that because he doesn't really, he doesn't have time for the mundane things of life. That's how Aristotle looked at God. Um, nobody was an atheist back then. I mean, let me just kind of point that out. I mean, they didn't even have atheism, really. Atheism in this, in, in, in this ancient world was, you're an atheist because you only believe in one God versus all the multiple gods that most of the people were uh, believing in. So the, the philosophers were the kings until the monotheists came in and kind of booted them out. So Plotinus is important because he, he studied Plato, but then what he actually was the one that kind of came up with this three part um, sense of the soul. So you've got the one, you've got the divine intelligence, and then you got the universal soul. I spelled it wrong. Um, so he wasn't a Christian. He, he, he didn't believe in the Trinity like Christians developed later, but he created this three parts of the soul thing. So remember all this as we're moving forward. All right, so here's question number one. Do, I'm really glad that we've got scientists here. Do we see science and philosophy as antagonistic to religion? And I found two scriptures. One is in the Quran and one is in the Bible. Quran states, the scholar's ink is more sacred than the blood of martyrs. Proverbs 18, 15 states, an intelligent heart acquires knowledge and the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. All right, science and philosophy people, yeah. do we think these two are antagonistic? Go ahead, Dorothy. Speaking for myself. Yes. No. Okay. I wouldn't be here if I did. There you go. <laughs> I think it's fair to say, because our author actually believes that it is. <laughs> Let me just put that out there. I have met numerous tomes on it, okay. but I, I see them as uh, supplementary. Supplementary, that's a good word. Okay. <clears throat> so maybe antagonistic isn't the right word. Is there another word that you would say? No. Anybody? Um, I don't know, challenging maybe? Yeah. Um, but but I think later on, and I can't remember who it was, but towards the end of the chapter, it talks about that it was really healthy for religion. Yeah, yeah, that's better. So you know, the the Quran, the early the early um, Muslims did not think so. I mean, this is actually in the Quran. The scholars' ink is more sacred than blood. So what's interesting <laughs> about what happened in the ninth ninth century and this is a big slide so i do want to kind of spend a little time with it before you go on go ahead i think we may think that they're complementary but i don't think christianity has always felt that way otherwise oh, right. why why would galileo have uh, had problems with uh, the church it and still turns philosophy sometimes has been viewed by church even contemporary christians well as the opposite of uh, as a substitute for religion yeah that's church. right, and, and therein lies the problem when people try to rationalize the stories of the Bible right. with the objective findings that science gives to us yeah. and meld the two together. Yeah. And that's why we have people who literally believe the world is 6,000 years old and dinosaurs lived in the age of Jesus and that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Because they're trying to prove the timeline. Yeah, they're, they're trying to prove that the two timelines work together, and, right. and clearly they don't. Right. Um, but I think we also have to look at what science is. I, I think philosophy is more like religion, maybe less so than uh, mm -hmm. science. Yeah. I think there's a strong relationship between philosophy and theology. I think those yeah. two kind of in some cases go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. But I see science as uh, why things are the way that they are. Why? Or, or maybe how things are the yeah. way that they are. How? Okay. And religion, the, to me, the domain of religion is to explain to me or help me to understand what's my role in all of this. What, what does it mean to me? Um, and I, I 
you know, I, I appreciate that people try to mix the two and say that they go together, but it's never worked for me personally. So I appreciate the contribution of both religion and science yeah. to my understanding of the, the universe, however yeah. meager that may be. But they answer different questions to you. Yes. I like that. Yeah. I like that. And that's okay to say. I mean, I, you know, but that's, a, that's what's kind of cool about these type of classes. It's like, you know, it, it's not important that we all agree. <laughs> it's, it's important that we all kind of look at it and decide for ourselves. Arlene? It's, <clears throat> pardon me, it seems like a lot of, of young people going into college, you know, they're right at that age, that time where they're trying to figure out whether the parents' upbringing and teachings at church really mesh with them and a lot of them kind of drift away yeah and it seems like a lot of them get into philosophy philosophy classes and kind of feel like they're right in disputing religion yeah so i think it, the question it tends time, to yeah. draw people away in that way yeah um mm -hmm. Right, but part yeah. of it's the age that they are and the part that stage yeah. of their life too. Well, and I have, you know, my experience with with you know friends and even in my own life is if you if you grow up with a very certain belief system of religion and then you go to college and they teach you about these other religions or in my case Alma Blair <laughs> taught me about the history of the church and I went what you know <laughs> and so it was basically then you are challenged with am I going to have the same beliefs as my childhood and that's the crisis for the young people right. and some of them they'll abandon it some of us adapt you know and this it's kind of a time I actually you know we, we've talked about this before I love talking to you know the Jesse Bennett's of the world because they they do they question everything you know <laughs> I love that about them and you know a book like this hopefully would appeal to people like that because it doesn't say you must obey these laws or whatever the rules are for that religion you know which I think is what it's hard for young people okay so ninth century were the new Muslims so we. You know, we had Islam last week, and we were talking about Muhammad, and it's just this huge movement. And so these new Muslims were actually getting the Greek philosophers translated into Arabic. So they were studying Plato, and they were studying Aristotle, and then they made some great advances in philosophy, math, astronomy. And they started thinking, oh my gosh, how do we live rationally, and how do we you know, kind of marry up the the rational the rationality of the philosopher with our new religion. So they believed that the God of the Greek philosophers was identical with Allah. They thought re that rationalism represented the most advanced form of religion and evolved a higher notion of God than what was revealed in scripture. I thought that was interesting. Rationalism is even higher than what was revealed in scripture that becomes muddy later but um, they were still devout to the prophet muhammad but they wanted to purify religion from all of its primitive parochial elements and they were saying that god's existence was self-evident but they wanted to prove his existence anyway because you could do it with rationalism. It's, it's possible to do. Maybe we should have been the rational church of Jesus Christ. <laughs> we are pretty rational, aren't we? We like to explain things. <laughs> um, they wanted to go beyond history. They wanted to say that God is reason. Um, God can be discovered in logical arguments. I always like logical arguments. And uh, both Quran and science led to God, which is kind of what their process was. And their axiom was you could not seek scientific solutions that had a universal application in the laboratory and then pray to a God who was increasingly regarded by the faithful as the sole possession of the Muslim. And if you guys remember, you know, the Quran and, and Muhammad always said that there that the Muslim faith was not the only faith that, you know, this is the one true church kind of a argument. They said that anybody of the book, I think is the words that were used, 
is also faithful and they and so they he was muhammad was very inclusive of judaism and actually tried to kind of reconcile and you know he, he failed a little bit there but i guess he failed a lot but <laughs> but he was saying that all of these religions with the with the one true, one god the monotheists were true religions so this is called the Abbasid period, 759 to 1258. And I just wanted to point out a few of them to you that I didn't know these people, but you know, the brothers, um, Banu Masu, they, they um, illustrated works. Of the Islamic world and he, might have had the first flight, but he wasn't very successful. He had a rudimentary hang glider that uh, he, at age 65, he jumped off a mountain and he remained air airborne for several minutes, <laughs> which I thought that was funny, <laughs> before he landed badly and hurt his back. Yeah, so it's like, well, but uh, it's kind of cool to see all of these, these um, Renaissance men, so to speak. And I, I wanted to share this picture with you. Has anybody ever seen that before? Call it the elephant clock. This was by a Muslim named Al Jazeera, and it had all of these mechanisms in it. And there were so many influences from different cultures that he actually wanted it to show his multicultural mentality. So it had the dragons from the Chinese culture, and it had um, the elephant representing the Indian and the African cultures, phoenix represent Persian, Waterworks represent Greek, and the turban on the guy represents the Islamic culture. And it was this big, huge mechanical clock. And if you if you Google it, there's a lot of different versions of it too. You know, so it's kind of I don't know. Inventions are fascinating. This is all in that same time period. <laughs> so our author picked out quite a few um, of the the um, these are philosophers. And hold on a second. Okay, yeah, I, I actually skipped what the word is. When you see the word philosoph, you're saying philosopher. And so every once in a while, she would just say philosoph, and I would have to go back and say, what does she mean by that? Okay, it's it's the Arabic word for philosopher interchangeably throughout the chapter, which completely confused me, but whatever. I found it confusing also. <laughs> okay. Yeah, she does that a lot. Okay, yeah, she wants it's to not teach us word. new words. Yeah. That's the new word, you guys. Pelasuf. <coughs> Pelasuf <coughs> means philosopher. So so here is um, the Yabu, I'm not gonna try, I'm just gonna do the abolded version. You know, Al-Kindi, we'll call him Al-Kindi. So he was one of the earliest philosophers, and so remember they come from this Islam faith. So they're trying to to you know compare and contrast their religious belief with their their new philosophies. And he said, "We should not be ashamed to acknowledge truth and to assimilate it from whatever source it comes to us, even if it's from former generations and foreign peoples. There is nothing of higher value than truth itself." So. Once again, they're trying to be multicultural. He agreed with Aristotle that God was the unmoved mover. God got the ball, the ball rolling, but he also he adhered to the Quranic doctrine, and this was in the religious part of the world, of ex nihilo, which means out of nothing, that God basically started with nothing and you know created the world. So. It's kind of a little bit of both where God isn't paying any attention to the world versus God created the world. His name is actually biblical, Jacob and Isaac, Jacob and Ishak. Jacob, son of, uh, son of Isaac. Well, that is interesting. That's true for Jacob. Jacob, well, now I get it. Jacob, even, because even means from? I think that means from. Okay. okay. Which would be like our own, yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, so that's what Eva means? I thought it was from the father. Oh, okay. The father, okay. You know. okay, so 
This guy we're calling R. Razi. Somebody else wants to say the other name, they can. <laughs> um, brilliant physician, head of hospital in Iran. He rejected the, met the Aristotle's um, metaphysics, metaphysics um, issues like the other guy did, but he also rejected the creation issue of ex nihilo. So what he said was he, he was the first free thinker to find the concept of God incompatible with the scientific outlook. He argued that no true perusuk could rely on an established tradition. He had to think things through for himself because reason alone leads to truth. Reliance on revealed doctrines, and I put that in quotes because that's like the, the prophet, the Quran, is useless because religions could not agree. <laughs> now, you're going to see throughout this chapter also that we had a lot of elitists in this world. They say some pretty crazy things about the masses. This guy was a little bit tame, where all he said was philosophy only appeals to those with a certain IQ. So, you know, so, and he did get challenged on it because there were a lot of people in this world that were saying, what about the common people? Um, Al Farabi in 980, he was actually the, uh, they, they call him the authentic um, philosopher, <laughs> philosopher, Renaissance man. He was a physician, he was a musician, and then he ended up becoming a mystic, which we're going to see a lot of these guys. They start as philosophers and then they find that kind of incompatibility thing and then they end up mystics. So we go on to the next chapter and they're the mystics. He wrote um, opinions of the inhabitants of the virtuous city because in his mind, Muhammad was the type of leader that Plato had envisioned. So remember we talked about Plato thought that a philosopher should be the, the leader um, and it, 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 religion or society should be led by a true philosopher. And Al-Farabi <laughs> said that that's who Muhammad was. Muhammad had expressed timeless truths in the imaginative form people could understand. Islam was suited for Plato's ideal society. And then and then he went into Aristotle. I'm not going to go into it a lot because I didn't understand it. <laughs> but they're talking about emanations or intellects. And if somebody can explain it better than me, you please, please do. But my understanding is that um, that even though God is this unmoved mover, there are these emanations from God, which means like heavenly types of beings. So there's like a su succession of them, you know, so from plants to animals to humanity, there's, we all kind of rise up and then the humans are the highest because we have this divine reason. But it, but it, Sounded like it was like a succession of it and just sort of emanated from God and not necessarily created by God. Is that fair? Is that a fair? <laughs> They're looking at people. <laughs> okay. Um, he saw philosophy as a superior way of understanding truths, which the prophets had expressed in a poetic, metaphorical way in order to appeal to the people. So you're going to see a lot of philosopher versus prophet throughout these these people, you know, kind of reconciling the two. So at this time, there were, there were kind of, you had the Sunnis who were the um, kind of by the, by the book people, you know, you had the Sunnis and then you had the Shias. And remember, Shias, ones that have the Imams that uh, I, I, we compared it a lot to our own church, you know, it's like RLDS versus Mormon, you know, the Mormons prophet became you know, the guy who they think Joseph Smith appointed and the RLDS thought we all decided that it was his son, you know, because not only had he appointed him, but it was it was his successor with descendant. Well, that's very, very similar to what they're talking about with the imams. It was Muhammad de designated this guy Ali ibn Abi Talib. And then there were like six glorious centuries, you know, um, of um, saintly imams until unfortunately this guy Jafar, he appointed a, his son Ismail. Is that Ishmael? Mm -hmm. Probably Ishmael. Okay. 
didn't think about that either. Okay. He appointed his son Ishmael and died, but then unfortunately his son died very young. So then they had this dilemma. What do you do when Ishmael died? The Twelvers decided to accept the authority of Jafar's brother, Musa, and then they went on and they believed that that there were 12 imams and they're waiting for um, the final day. So they, it, they're called the Twelvers. But the Seveners were the ones that stopped with Ismail. And they said that, they, that the line from Muhammad stopped and ended with Ismail. So the Seveners believed that, the, um, that Ismail went into hiding, which I thought was kind of interesting, even though I think everybody knew he died, right? Is that, is that right? Am I saying it right? Marilyn. Um, I, I'm not sure about that. Well, yeah, he, he did die. Okay. Um, you mean the yes. Yeah. <laughs> but um, so the Twelvers are the Sufi line. No. Sufis, I don't think so. I think they're still or, Shias. Oh, Shias, sorry. Shias. Yes. Too many answers. Okay. Shias. And then the Seveners are the uh, Sunni. No. They are a sect of Shia. They are. Okay. Yeah, okay. they're all Shia. Okay. Because they believe in the Imam. That's the distinction between Sunni and Shia. The, the, the Shias really believe when they, they went with the person and the and the Sunnis went with the the book kind of that's how I say probably because yeah. the Shias were all involved in the lineage and they yeah. probably didn't want to listen. Exactly. So the Seveners are the ones that we're going to talk about because they, they broke off from these other guys. That that's the Ismaili sect and we're going to talk about it some more. But the, the Sufis are important because that's the mystical form. Of Islam, that's what we're going to talk. We're going to talk about it more, but that's the spiritual dimension. That's basically getting Sufism, you know. And so Shia and Sufism are going to end up kind of. I think I think Sufism kind of takes over, at least in this time frame, a lot of what happened with Shia, because the philosophers couldn't. Basically, they couldn't do it. They tried to to make religion rational, and then, as you'll see from a guy in the future, it just it's just not possible to some extent to, to be completely rational. Did anybody else notice that several of those names are from Disney movies? <laughs> Jafar. Jafar, Musa. <laughs> <laughs> the names of Disney movies are from them. Yeah, that's <laughs> what I think. Well, I agree, but I just, just on my own. Yeah, we've, got the Disney, we've got the Disney version of the history. <laughs> Probably names like Jim and John and Sam. Yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, and then people, I mean, we went through my name, for instance, a lot of people named their kids after biblical characters. Sure. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably the same. In yeah. Oh, absolutely. In yeah. Islam, that people named their kids yeah. after famous. Oh, yeah. How many Muhammads people? are there in our world? Yeah. 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 I know. <laughs> Tell a story about that. When I started teaching at Park, my very first class, I had about a dozen students. And I came home and I said, Russ, I have three guys with the same name in my class. Guess what it is? <laughs> and he said, Mohammed. And I said, close, no cigar, with Abdul. Abdul, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so here's the seveners. Remember, they're the ones that kind of decided that that the, the Imam line stopped with Ismail. So now they're kind of caught up in this rationalistic world and they're trying to talk about it. And their poem is, which I thought was interesting, in jealousy, I cannot speak the imam's name in this poem, but I can only say that for him, Plato himself would become a slave. <laughs> like they're they're venerating that imam so high that they're saying not only does he fit into Plato's world, but Plato would be kind of a slave to the world. So it's like it's like they're even going beyond philosophy in some ways. Um Philosophy and science were not ends as to themselves, but were spiritual disciplines to enable them to perceive the inner meaning of the Quran. So they called philosophy and science a spiritual discipline. They use science to develop their imaginations. You'll see the word imagination a lot in this. Um, they merged the Platonic views with Al Farabi's views, um, and that's that whole emanations thing that we were talking about. Um, but this, they actually kind of 
put it with Islam and said that Muhammad, Muhammad was full of the celestial scheme. So he was in the first heaven. Ali was in the second heaven. And then for all the other imams, up down to the seven of them, there were these other succeeding spheres until they got to, I thought it was kind of the closest to earth is wisdom, Sophia. And they, they named it after Ali's wife, Fatima which I thought was interesting. Now, I do find it a little fascinating, and I could be wrong in, in how I'm reading this stuff, but it's very fascinating to me that they're talking about levels of heaven, you know? Mm. Don't you think? I mean, is, is, is that similar to what we learned? This is our RLDS thing again. <laughs> so we have telestial, terrestrial, celestial heavens in the um, RLDS family. Well, that's exact. For those who are dispensationalists in the Latter-day Saint tradition, there are seven levels of time, uh, seven millennia, over each one is presided by Moses, Elijah, Jesus, and then finally Joseph Smith at the end. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. I missed that. And, and that's, I mean, that, those were the teachings um, that, that some offered back in the probably 50s and 60s. I remember my grandmother talking a lot about that. Do you and think it other, comes from, other, from do you, I don't know. I don't know. If, I don't know Joseph if Smith is fascinating. Smith, yeah, he, I don't know if that's yeah. where Joseph Smith got the idea, but in the early 1900s, the preachers would make these uh, long banners and they'd roll them out at the revival meetings and it would have all of the dispensations on there and what happened in each thousand year reign. And of course, at the very end, the last reign was Joseph Smith Jr. Before Christ came back? Or is that after right, Christ? Right, yeah, no, oh. before Christ came back. But the interesting thing was oh, wow. you can really see the emphasis on Joseph Smith as being important because yeah. his picture was much bigger than the picture of Jesus. <laughs> 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 oh, the they actually have this in the archives. It's oh my they, gosh, I did not know we, this. We should take a trip over there we and should. see if the archivist at the temple can bring one of them out. It's, it's fascinating. There is a text, the seven dispensations of time. Okay, yeah. I'll I, that's I me. actually taught that class here. We went through that. Yeah. Uh, but it was back in the 70s. Wow. So is that still what you all believe? The seven? Okay. No. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I didn't know. even, there, I didn't even know about some. it. I'm hoping I wasn't I, in I this class. Heard, heard <laughs> I don't know if they're still, you know, in restoration groups, it's probably still important. Yeah, there's a lot of things that we've kind of abandoned. Christ, it's necessarily taught anymore. I don't even remember learning that as a child. You know, I mean, I, I learned a lot of stuff as a I child. I never heard of it, and I grew up in that town, too. Oh, well, there you go. Well, and we're not the only church that preaches no, like that so. study dispensationalism. Other Christian religions have as well. I yeah. think, who was the Garner Ted Armstrong, or the, there was a radio preacher yeah. um, who preached a lot of that. Kind of theology back in the 50s. Are you guys hearing all this? Most yes. <laughs> well, we heard part of it. Uh, but like Paul said, dispensationalism is not unique to early church members. I mean, other Protestants have had that. I think Schofield Bibles is a big source of that dispensationalism, if I'm, if I'm right. Do you see that as as similar to what we're talking about here with what the seminars <coughs> believed? I'm kind of just wondering. It just it just reminded me of it. I don't know if that's the same. They're kind of they're, we're kind of at opposite ends of the spectrum here. When they talk about these seven heavens, they're talking about the beginning of time. Is how I understand it. I mean, it sounds like they're talking about presiding over um, a, a sphere a location, a physical location for levels of heaven, whereas I think dispensationalism is presiding, that person presided over that period of time on Earth. in history. Yeah, on wow. Earth. And, and I'm thinking, and I may be wrong, but I think purgatory for the Catholics may be um, similar. Interesting. Of course, of course, um, yeah, dispensationalism has to do with eras of time, but uh, the heaven, you know, the levels of heaven, that's that's in Paul's writings where he says it. Uh, somebody, I think it's talking about himself, says he was caught up into a third heaven. third heaven. And I think there was Jewish belief in levels of heaven back back then. 
Well, even the, even the, um, I went back one time and compared, because I was just confused what Joseph Smith was talking about, because he changed the Bible to say celestial, terrestrial, and telestial kingdom. So I went back and looked at the King James Version. It actually does say sun, moon, and stars, you know, and so there is something to it. I just think he went beyond it, you know, just, it's just interesting how all of these religions seem to have this concept that keeps flowing around it, so you know, interesting. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, and this was, a, this is why some of you missed my beautiful singing at the beginning of class. Hello, sorry. But the, the Ismailis, the Ismailis read the Quran, they called it Tawil, like, like they were carried back to reading the archetypal interpretation of the Quran. So that's where we go into this album you know, and comparing it to harmony in music and the words of the Quran. Remember, we talked about it last week with when Dennis was teaching us that in, with, in Arabic, the Quran is just this beautiful, you know, it, it, it's spiritual because of the words, you know, and so what these, what these people were trying to do was they were trying to carry back and, and read the words in understand the heavenly counterpart of these spiritual words. So I, I thought that was interesting. I, I, I think my next slide talks about it a little bit more too. Well, don't they sing the Torah as well? Well, you think about Hebrew and the Torah. I mean, they, it's, it's so, I love listening to cantors, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, this, it's just this different way of reading the scripture. That's why I did my little chant. Gregorian chanting is this, I think the closest we've got in the Christian world, we, you know, we have these beautiful hymns and everything, but we don't really stop. You know, the cantor is singing the words, you know, and that's what the that's what the Muslims do every time that they that they pray. So this was the guy that oh, the Ismailis started this thing where they spoke in double negatives, which I can't stand, by the way, <laughs> which is uh, God is not nothing. You know, so that means he must be everything, you know. Okay, well, then just say hey, God is everything, you know. Logically, but, it means God is something. Yeah, <laughs> true. But what they, the reason why they were doing this, and you'll see it a little bit more, is that they were saying that language is so inadequate to convey the mystery of God that we're going to confuse you with our language <laughs> and talk in double negatives. That's how I look at it. I, I'm glad they abandoned it because I'm not, I'm not a fan. Well, you got to realize how much that is when you try to translate something from one language to another, because a lot of languages don't have an equivalent word. That's true. That's true. Well, isn't it true that the Muslims believe that the words in the Quran are direct from God yes. and must not be translated into any other language? Well, that last part, I don't know about. They actually do. That's what that's what we were talking about last week is they absolutely do believe that they were it was directly from God. Muhammad was the what did you say? He was the reciter. He, it was a it, it was a recitation from God. Like God, Muhammad, you know, but and so it doesn't translate well. What they say is you can't get it into any other language. You miss the meaning, you know, yeah. so I don't think I don't think they've ever said that it's you can't, but I think that it's not as spiritual if it's in another language. I think there are some fundamentalist sects of Islam who do believe that it cannot be translated in other. Yeah, I could, I could see that. It's the language <clears throat> of uh, the Arabic language that has to be translated. And regarding your, your double negatives, I really think what they're trying to say is that if you say God is good, God is not good because yeah. you know it, it forces you that space in between that's indefinable that then you get some kind of sense of what God really is because he's not good there you go. and he's neither not good. <laughs> now that is spoken like a true philosopher, right? There. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just the gra I'm the grammar queen in this world. I'm trying to get myself out of it, Jonathan, but I do agree with you. That's exactly what they're saying. <laughs> and you're they're trying to make us understand, and that's where I have this this um, screen up here, they're trying to make us understand that language is inadequate. You know, that is kind of the point. And, they, and these people were trying to train their ears. So
so that this this clamorous critical faculty in the brain so it's basically that analytical side of our brains and unfortunately i let it get in my way a lot that they're trying to say okay you need to be conscious of the silence that surrounds a word the word alm really is the perfect word for it you know if you've ever done any kind of yoga and you've been around people who who understand it they really do understand my nephew's in yoga and he says sometimes the whole the whole class is the word Aum, you know. It very much correlates to our all men. Okay, okay. That's what I wanted to say. That's what I wanted to ask you guys. What mm -hmm. words in your experience would you put that sense of wonder around God? I, I shared with you, I really do think that singing in like a Gregorian chant way is the best way for me to feel the scriptures you know and uh kind of understand in between the words it's such an interesting concept to me let's just sit with it for a minute because i talk too much <laughs> <laughs> i'm not doing what they ask me to do <laughs> it makes me think of what is it what the spiritual reading where you read the one verse over and over liturgical Thank you. there you go yes in fact um the world church is saying that if you repeat the script they, they have this thing where you need to repeat scriptures three times because there is something about that repetition in liturgical reading I, just to, to backtrack just a little bit on the, the double negatives too i think <laughs> for these early philosophers they may have decided that God is so great, the magnitude of God is so wonderful and um, inexpressible that it's easier to say what God is not. Yes. And when you're done saying what God is not, everything that is left is God. Yes. That helps a little bit. Okay. On the repeating thing, it could have something to do, could be related to what you learn in speech class. You know, tell them what you're going to tell them, then tell them, and then tell them what you told them. <laughs> but I, I think we're talking about resonating. I mean, all of us feel, you know, we know we have our favorite hymns and we have, a, you know, we, sometimes, you know, like Ron sometimes reads the hymns for us. And I think when you're reading the hymns in your sermon, Ron, it's because you want us, I don't know, I'm putting words in your mouth, but you want us to pay attention to the words, you know? And so what means you have to like take a break and say, oh, I wasn't just singing that, you know, you have to kind of get the meaning around it. What do they say? The silence that surrounds the word. That's very poetic. I love that. I, I don't know that we have words, that, but I think we have yeah. phrases. Yeah. Okay. You know, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Yeah. And, That's a good one. Uh, you know, there are several that I, phrases that come to mind that we, yeah. we repeat, even our, even our baptism, not baptism. Our, our communion prayers, they're repetitious. And if you really listen to them and start thinking about them, it, it serves the same purpose, I think, as we're talking about here with a single word. Yeah. We're, we're not a liturgical church, but if yeah. you go to a church like Maryland's church that has a liturgy where there's lots of repetition every week and everybody knows what to say next. Yeah, yeah. How uh, does that feel? Does, yeah. Is there a spiritual? I mean, I mean, there's got to be like well, the, the one chant that I think of um, is "Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy." Have mercy. Yeah, Lord Kyrie eleison is oh, in yeah. Latin. Yeah. Um, Do you so, say it in Latin and English, or? But I just remember it. You I, know, I love that because the Latin is it speaks even more sometimes to me because it's so beautiful. Yeah. But yeah, okay, that's what we're talking about exactly. Yeah. So sometimes, depending on the mass, it's either sung. They have a cantor and we repeat what each phrase and then sometimes we sing it after them or we speak it depending on if it's a high mass or a low mass. So. Oh. But even if you listen to the words of the priest, you hear the same, you know, I in the mass when the priest, I guess, is blessing the host. Mm -hmm. I say, Lord, I am not worthy to receive you. Only say the word and I shall be healed. Right. That gets me every time. Oh, so, yeah. That's you know. nice. Jane? Yes, yes, Dennis. I don't know if I have any spiritual words. I kind of think of Francis of Assisi saying, when he said, I preach Christ, preach Christ, but if necessary, use words. For me, 
some of the sense of wonder comes from being in places where no words were used. I'm thinking of when we were walking in um, the Redwood Forest in California and you had the sense that to me, it was kind of like, I'm in the presence of things that have been alive for maybe a couple thousand years. Yeah. And there was just a sense of wonder there. No words were used. Well, and I do think that's the feeling that they're trying to get, they're trying to talk about. It's like no words can describe it. You know, that's that's pretty much what they were saying about scripture. The, the, the Quran was so sacred to them that they wanted to savor it. Like like what we're talking about, you know, walking in the redwood forest. You don't need to say this is from God because you already know you're just standing there, you know. I, I would love to have that experience. <laughs> okay. Another thought on that before you leave is okay. Is the um, the Jewish tradition and maybe that's Islamic also, uh, at least in Judaism, they don't use the word God. They use another word for God because they don't want to say God. <laughs> that's right, because it's too sacred. Because that's that's the whole point of that sacredness of the word. So it's just, you know, we're all going to be now singing and we're going to be, you know, watching our words a little bit more. And, you know, we're, they're going to pop out at us, I think, more because uh, I just think in, to, to do it intentionally is a, is a good thing, too. That's what these philosophers were trying to do. OK, so now we've got Ali Ibn Sina. And he was a child prodigy. So all these Ismailis had, were coming to argue with his father. And so by the age of 16, he was he was advising physicians. And in his mind, the Abbasid Caliphate was in decline. So he didn't see it as that place to ideal, like, um, like our earlier philosophers were talking about. So he was trying to figure out kind of a compromise between the Aristotle teaching that God is pure reason, and the God of revelation from the Quran. And what he said was, while God would not sully himself <laughs> with base and trivial minutia of life on earth, in his eternal act of self-knowledge, remember Aristotle's got him just thinking, he's up there just thinking, you know? So what Ibn Sina says is God apprehends everything that has emanated from him. He knows that he is the cause of contingent creatures his eternal contemplation of his, himself generates the process of, of emanate, emanation. So we're actually kind of combining now that ex nihilo, which is you know God making something out of nothing, and we are combining it with Aristotle's God is just the prime mover, just sitting there, and everything emanates from him, but he doesn't care. Yeah. You know? So so he so we're combining them in this guy's thought process. I just find these these younger philosophers and um, theologians fascinating because I know that we are trying to figure things out right now in 2021, but they were just really trying to figure out these basic, big, huge arguments, which had to be a fascinating time to live. <laughs> so here's this guy, Al-Ghazali. He's the one that he actually grew up in the Sunni faith, so he was trying he was he was an academic and he was he was charged with going and and um, defending the Sunni doctrines against what these Ismailis were talking about. But unfortunately, and I liked how our author described him, Al Ghazali had a restless temperament that made him struggle with truth like a terrier, <laughs> you know, worrying problems to the bitter death. And so what he wanted was he wanted absolute certainty and he wasn't getting it. He was trying to figure out, okay, the, the philosophers say that they acquire knowledge by this rational argument, but how can God be tested empirically? He says, you can't, all right. Then he says, the Shias felt that knowledge was found in the teachings of their Imam, but how can we be sure these Imams were divinely inspired? You can't. And then Sufis found knowledge in mystical disciplines from the Quran, but how can we be sure that these weren't just 
delusions. <laughs> so he's basically taking everything that they're saying can prove their faith and can prove their their reason. And he's and he he's just saying, no, you cannot have absolute certainty. So he he went into a clinical depression, basically. So <laughs> so Netflix, you got You're arguing with yourself too much. He wrote, hey, no, he wrote a book called Inco Incoherence of the Philosophers. I, I love that. Yeah, he's depressed. He quit his academic post. And then what but he what he did was he turned to the mystics. And so this word, somebody can else can pronounce it, Wujud, which literally means he found in Arabic. And what happened was, is that when he kind of quit thinking, it, it, it basically is what everybody else has been saying with, with what we're talking about with the words. When he stopped, he was able to find the religious experience. The only, and, and he says that the only way of verifying reality beyond, hang on a second. He found that the religious experience was the only way of verifying a reality that lay beyond the reach of the human intellect and cerebral process. So it's the Sufi's way. It was not rational, but it was more akin to an intuitive experience. So he was able to find, to find that's what this he found thing means, the, essent, the essential truths of Islam by reliving its central experience, going back to the Quran, living it spiritually, so he was talking about reading the Quran in a prophetic spirit. And um, we, we talked uh, about different portions of the Quran last week, but he was he was reading the Quran, Quranic Surah of Light as transcending time and space. So, so this is where the mystical and the philosopher are starting to kind of combine a little bit. And, and, and perhaps it was with the way the philosophers were looking at words too. You know, I'm not sure you can be completely rational when you study religion. You know, you have to have that leap is what he's talking about. That leap of the religious intuitive experience that takes you beyond the intellect. It takes you beyond your way of thinking. The Sufis, the subsect of Islam that do the dancing, they dance themselves mm -hmm. into a frenzy and in an attempt to create an ecstatic experience that that sounds right. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Does that sound right? Some of them. Some of them yeah. yeah. You have to take yeah. that leap of faith. Yeah. Yeah. We're kind. We're kind of getting back into the religious, intuitive experience. When you read, you know, a lot of us. That's how we read the Bible too. You know, it's like when you read the Bible, you need to have some intuition with what you know what it means for you today, kind of a thing. I was just going to suggest that's basically how we come to our spirituality. I think for both of us. Yeah. You know, we, we take the science, we take the history and then yeah. we make a leap of faith and come up with a intuition of what it, what the yeah. meaning is. So so Jane, I wanted to add that in the book it says that Ghazi um says that it's beyond the reach of human intellect and cerebral reality. Right. So basically, you know, I think it's just different parts of the brain and trying to get above that. Yeah. It, it's the intuition. Yeah. It's the kind of, yeah. some would call it the gut, you know, some of, yeah. we have the word discernment in our religion a lot, you know, we use that, it's it's that discernment of the spirit within the words that he finally found, and he found peace, too, so that's good news. Well, yeah. that's kind of what the monks do. Yeah, oh yeah. I was thinking of some of the scientific things that, that I can't remember what these are, but there are certain things in science that you can prove that you can't prove. You cannot prove Occam's these. razor. Yeah. Occam's razor thing. Oh that's that's the easy answer is probably the correct one. Oh that's not right. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> science at all. Axiom. No, no, there I mean we're talking about math, mathematical things. Yeah. That show that you, it's a proof that you can't prove. Yeah. Well, I have always thought of scientists, and I, I actually like this about you guys, that you go and you go to an experiment and you're actually trying to disprove it more than you're actually trying to prove it, you know, because then you say, oh, I can't disprove that. So this must be true, you know. So 
it's, it's actually maybe it's starting from a negative. The null hypothesis. The what? The null hypothesis. The null hypothesis. Okay. So I wanted to go into a little bit about this gifts of the spirit kind of a thing because this kind of resonated with me too in, in our own religion. That uh, I thought it was <laughs> funny. Our author said, you're, "Because just because you're tone deaf doesn't mean music is an illusion." You know. <laughs> So you can probably, for the tone deaf people of the world, you can still enjoy music. <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> deaf people can enjoy some music. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. I think there was a movie, uh, Room with a View, was about the deaf girl that, uh, you know, got into music and and they worked with the the vibrations and stuff. Okay. And, there you go. Uh, yeah. yeah they're great. more than tone deaf, they're totally yeah. deaf. That's how Beethoven wrote his ninth symphony is that by the vibrations That's right. because he was deaf at that time. Yeah, I knew that. Just a little sidebar. We were we went to Grace onto a choir concert uh Friday night. I care in that. But this Beethoven uh number that you just mentioned that he wrote when he was tone deaf. Yeah. Okay, the, the yeah. director said he just had to tell a little story. Yeah. There is a gal that was singing in the choir. That is deaf, not tone deaf, deaf. She placed her hand on the piano and took her shoes off so she was barefoot on the floor to feel the vibration so she could sing. Wow. Yeah. And it was just, it was one of those mind blowing experiences. The number that they performed there. was Beethoven tonight. Oh my gosh. I love about getting, so there you go. Yeah. And it's chivalry. totally dissonant. You know, it, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Wow. But it, it, this idea of the vibration communicating yeah what was there yeah. so she and Beethoven was actually deaf right he was actually deaf when he wrote right. yeah you can talk. actually get like a box of stands that can play music and the stand will pull the camera out yeah and do a design um he isn't a big enough bass speaker yeah <laughs> well I mean you're not trying to blast it but it's it's just yeah it's, yeah. it's really cool that's cool what what can happen so because Al-Ghazali had, had lived through the brink of his own skepticism, <laughs> he could now teach that it was absolutely impossible to prove God's existence beyond a reasonable doubt. <clears throat> the reality that we call God lays outside the realm of sense perception and logical thought. So science and metaphysics could neither prove nor disprove the wujud, remember that? of Allah, the existence of Allah. So question, we've got a lot of prophetic spirit issues in this chapter. And I know that our own religion has kind of, we've gone through a lot of prophets and, and prophetic spirits. And we believe that God still speaks to us today. So I just wanted to throw out there the question, you know, I mean, it, it it does make it tricky. I mean, the, the imams, the, the Shias in the world that we now see, you know, I mean, I think the imams can easily lead people astray with their prophetic voice. And we have seen it in our own religion. And I think any religion, you know, I think it's a very delicate gift. Let me just say it that way. Well, that's how you get these cults that draw people in. Yeah. And, you know, Jonestown, you know, yeah, we're exactly. all going to go to. <laughs> and so it's really kind of on all of us to have that discerning spirit to be able to know when it's no longer in harmony, you know, to use the music metaphor, but to hear the dissonance. I think and that's the basis of the fanaticism. Yeah. That in no, every religion, no. in every religion can go every which way, you know. So I mean, that to me is what I'm kind of seeing in this chapter mm -hmm. as what could happen with that prophetic spirit. But these guys are still pretty, you know, these are the Shias, these are the Ismailis, and they say, you know, this is what the, the Torah has taught them. So they're true. They're, remember, there is no atheism. This is all about how do we read the Quran. You know, how do we read our scripture? And they're trying to be rational. <laughs> but they're slipping into skip into mysticism here. Well, what do you read the prophetic issue? Okay. Prophetic spirit. Did you 
think about it, we have, when women were brought into the priesthood, some people felt strongly that the Spirit told them that was right, and some thought it was wrong. Mm -hmm. When we admitted uh, people, uh, gay homosexuals into the priesthood, some people thought the Spirit told them that was right, and some people thought it was wrong. Mm -hmm. In our own congregation today, there are people who are on all across the political spectrum who believe God is telling them, the Spirit of God is telling them, this is the right and that's wrong. Mm -hmm. I just throw it out as kind of the, the dilemma when you talk about a prophetic people. Mm -hmm. At what point, whose prophetic voice do you, do you listen to? I mean, I know my answer, but. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, but, and, and from the Catholic perspective, um, abortion is a big one for us so i mean where people are divided but yeah because yeah once you say this is what god has told me or this is what i believe then you're not going to have very good arguments you know it's going to be two true believers arguing with each other and that's that's when well quite frankly and this is what this chapter is about that's when rationalism needs to come in you need to question your own subjectivity. You need to find an objective way of moving through this belief system. You know, I do think rationalism is important in our religions. So, Harry Black, you know, to me still, I still hear his voice when he said, you know, not to not to believe it because I said it. Mm -hmm. Believe it, or somebody else said, it. believe mm -hmm. it because it's in your heart. Yeah, yeah. figure it out. Figure, figure it out for yourself. Out. Yeah, that whole knowledge thing. Knowledge is. And I think key. you know the church has recognized that being rational is part of the prophetic process. If it was just God putting the answers into the minds of of the membership, then when we go to conference, we should never have a vote that isn't one hundred percent either up or down. Right. But the reality is that we're, we're trying to be rational in our thinking and we come to different conclusions sometimes and that's mixed with whatever level of inspiration that we're able to generate uh, from our spiritual lives. And it's really the two of those together that I think are functioning to, to help us be prophetic, whatever it is that that means. Well, that's why we've had so many splits off of the church you know, when all these different things came up because people, you know, they still had their their heart, you know, saying that this is what what I and I can't go that way. So I'll go my own way. Well and I do agree with this Al Ghazali guy that says the reality we call God lays outside the realm of our sense sense perception and logical thought anyway. So it's we're never ever gonna say we know the answer. Yeah, it's like I think as soon as we kind of learn that, it's like that. that that's what he said. He had to learn that. You know, he went to, into the clinical depression because he thought he needed to know the absolute certain answer. Well, guess what? There is none. <laughs> so, hello, <laughs> welcome to humanity. So he had an intellectual OCD. <laughs> Okay, so this guy, Ibn Rushd, was kind of interesting because, Rushdie. say it again? Rushdie, like Salman Rushdie. Is this like Salman Rushdie? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So he was arguing that philosophy was the highest form of religion. And he was, in his Arabic, he was, make, he was writing commentaries on Aristotle, which was interesting because it, I didn't realize this, that they weren't translated, Aristotle wasn't translated into Latin until later. And so the Western Christians actually kind of got behind everybody else. And Thomas Aquinas, which we're going to learn about, hopefully, well, maybe next week, uh, <laughs> he actually was reading this guy, Ibn Rushdie, you know, in, in Latin, because it had, it had just been, you know, Aristotle had just been translated, and this guy had just been translated. So he was, again, an intellectual elite. He was saying that there was no contradiction between religion and rationalism, but he said, don't tell the masses, it's going to confuse them, lead them to error and, and imperil their e eternal salvation. 
they may develop psychological disorders. <laughs> what the heck? And, uh, but then they could accept some of this truth. To, it was essential to teach them something for their own salvation, which, you know, I just thought that was bizarre that they thought that the lay people just could not handle it. Um, the the philosophers, the philosopher, the philosophers were the chief authorities on doctrine, and they alone were capable of interpreting the scriptures. Everybody else should just take the Quran at face value. That was interesting. So we're really developing elitism here, which I think was happening in all religions. Let's be let's be clear. <laughs> Well, you know, know, we all know that it was the, I think that the, the Catholic Church up until that time basically had the same philosophy yeah. as Luther, who uh, said that yeah. each man was his own priest. Exactly. It wasn't priest. until the Reformation that the, that Christianity said, wait a minute, maybe somebody else should be able to read that Bible, you know. Well, the early Jewish did that too, didn't they? You know, the only the, the priests in the temples could read the scriptures. And yeah. The, yeah. Here's the here's here's a rabbi. Here's a rabbi basically saying the same thing. That philosophy was the most advanced form of religion. It was the royal road to God. It was was really about the the prophets and the philosophers. But he actually chose the God of the prophets over the God of the philosophers. He said they both speak about the same God. But this is where it was kind of interesting. The prophet has to be more imaginative and intellectually gifted because he has that direct intuitive knowledge of God. It's a prophet. This is when, you know, that they were saying that we've got to go with the prophets. And Moses was the greatest prophet to, at least at this time, I'm, I'm kind of assuming it still is for the, for the Jewish people, but um, yeah, very, very similar, you know, concepts, you know, of the, this elitism in the Jewish faith. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm really gonna try to get to, this is just, um, which I thought was interesting because this Maimonides guy, he was kind of a um, student of Ibn Rushdi. And so I just thought it was interesting that there were a lot of their creeds. This was when they were starting to talk about creeds. And so obligatory doctrines, existence of God, the red is what they have together. They, they, they all, both Islam and Judaism say existence of God, unity of God, the validity of prophecy, which is, now that's the interesting one because they've got different prophets. And so what our author talks about is, okay, if you've got every religion saying it's the validity of prophecy that's the most important thing about our religion, then no one's ever gonna agree, you know, because you're gonna go with your prophet and not the other church's prophet. And I think that's at least one reason for a lot of these splits that we've had. But both Islam and Judaism believe in the resurrection of the dead at the end on the last day, which I thought was kind of fascinating because obviously comparing it to our Christian creeds and belief systems, there's a lot of similarities in these things. So um, let me just talk a little bit about the Christian philosophy was really lagged behind the, the Jewish and the Islam philosophers, because, you know, this is kind of talking a little bit about the, the timeline. You know, we've got the Crusades were the ones that started. Um, and in, in 796, the, um, the Western bishops, this is when the West and the East Christian world started to split. And the, the, the bishops in Southern France wanted to add a clause to the Nicene Creed that said that the Holy Spirit proceeded not only from the Father, but also from the Son. And Charlemagne was in charge at the time. He knew nothing about theology, so he said, okay, put it in, you know. But what happened was, is that the East, the Greeks, the Greeks were really pulling back in to say that the study of God should be just about the unity and the spirit of God. It shouldn't be about all of this um, debate and philosophy and the thinking that the Western church went. So, so this, is, this is when the Western church started really debating all of these different things, you know, the Eucharist and, you know, all these later things that the Western church started debating. The Eastern church didn't. So the Greeks actually said no, 
I, I was well, kind of ironic to me because the Greeks were the ones that created that had Aristotle and Plato, but the Greek Orthodox Orthodox Christians said, "No, we're not going to talk about this rational view of the scriptures or about God." And so, um, yeah, I don't. Sorry about that. I only got five minutes, and I'm not sure what I've got. Like maybe three more. Do you want to? Let's do those next week. Is that okay? Because I'm getting myself confused as I have a thought I, I process. I got 50 pages next week, but maybe I can go in next week after. I don't know. Yeah, maybe between the two of us, we can do the next two weeks. Is that okay with everybody? Will that mess everybody up? I just don't, yeah. I mean, this I is. Who, who does the third week? Uh, after Maryland, after you, after Maryland, who does the third one? I don't know. I don't know, Paul, it, 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 it might be Paul, Paul yeah. I know he needs to stick to me. Because this is this is a yeah. good place for me to start stop. I have to kind of start and then I can talk more about the Christians if I can get like just ten minutes. What I guess what I suggest based on what I'm hearing from Jane is that we split Maryland's chapter in half. You work with the Paul on the next Sunday, work with where to divide the chapter. Does that make sense or not? Or do, you do you want to do that? Do you oh, want you to mean do that so Mary? he talked about half the chapter? Is that well, it was, yeah. I told him what we, you and I had talked about. If you want to, I don't. You don't oh, I don't to. care. I'll, I'll talk to Paul about it and yeah. see. But, but you know, do those next week, and then we'll decide on okay. the rest of it. Well, I know next week you're you got a long chapter. Yeah. yeah. Compared to <laughs> I kept her. I she has like a fifty-page chapter, and the rest of us were twenty-five to thirty. It's like, well, that's not fair. <laughs> I said to Marilyn. I know it's taken me a long time to get through. <laughs> well, it's hard to get through them on the shorter ones. I know. There's a lot of no, there's a lot of stuff packed in this. Are you guys hanging in there with us? It, it's it is a lot. If you read good. this book, it's 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 you gotta read it twice. Yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah. Well, and I do like how at the end of the chapter she finally kind of goes back into the Christian world and shows. I mean, Christian, the Christian philosophers were lagging way behind the Muslim and the Jewish philosophy version of it. So it's, it's interesting how the Christian church split, you know, and why. It's you know, what, what's really amazing is you think about Western civilization as having done all this creative invention. And yeah. The, you know, the philosopher, yeah. the philosophical works and all. Yeah. And we, we don't really learn the fact that there's much of this happening. Yeah. In the East, even before it happened in the West. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. there, there was an Enlightenment period um, in yeah. the Western world that, that was actually shut down by conservative clerics. Mm -hmm. um, well, the Crusades the came through. Yeah. Right. But before that, because they were the ones who came up, Ron knows this, with the numbers. I mean, the Hindu, Arabic numbers yeah. are what we use in, you know, the discovery of zero, which was, yeah. you know, what opened up the entire, I know it's crazy, but um, opened up the entire mathematical. They came up with algebra. I mean, they they were very enlightened people until um, religious leaders, you know, thought it was blasphemy, whatever they want to call it. Yeah. And shut a lot of it down. And yeah. they were way ahead of us. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure the time period, but I think. One of the great libraries in the world was in Alexandria. Alexandria. Uh, and yeah. I think it was I think it was destroyed. Yeah. Oh yeah. Right. Everybody's yeah. always hoping that we'll discover yeah. all the wonderful things that they had in that library. Yeah. But that's why I wanted to throw in a couple of the you know the Renaissance yeah. men in the Muslim world. We just don't learn it. Well, we're kind of myopic. We, we yeah, we, we want to keep our own thing. Yeah. 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 Yeah.